Welcome to the Shetland Times podcast. I'm your host, Thor Holt. And before we meet today's guest, do remember we'd love to get your suggestions for who you'd like to hear us interview on the show. Shetlandtimes.co.uk. You can let us know via the Shetland Times website or via Facebook. Now, the mandatory Google search for today's guest reveals that he was born in Lurwick and his father was the island's surgeon. So let's talk to the gentleman himself. I hope you enjoy my conversation with Lord Norman Lamont of Lurwick, especially the part where he outwits me as I try to get him to talk politics. Lord Lamont? Yes? Thor Holt, Shetland Times podcast. Lovely, wonderful, just the man I wanted. Good. Thank you very much for ringing me now. Um, That's very good. Can we do the interview now? Absolutely. I had a, a band who were meant to be getting interviewed at half past nine, but they're obviously so rock and roll that they've, I don't know, got stuck in a hotel or a, or a law court or something, and they didn't seem to be able to make it. So I was able to move you forward from 11 to 10. So it was serendipity indeed. Right. Lovely. Great. There we are. Can I clarify, Lord Lamont? I'm, I'm sure I won't be the only person who wonders this, but how should one address a lord in person? Do you prefer me to keep saying Lord Lamont or... What's, what's the kind of the correct way of proceeding? Well, my friends just call me Norman. I don't mind if we start off as Lord Lamont and then descend into Norman. <laughs> <laughs> See if we can get a descent into friendship by the end of the interview. Good. OK, well, I'll call you Lord Lamont to begin with. And there's another controversy about your particular name, which I hear from, from Shetlanders, and they say it should be Lamont. Have you heard this? No, well, that, that, that's perfectly uh, correct. And, you know, it wasn't, I mean, I've now lived in England since I was uh, um, 13 or so. Um, my, my father made an uphill struggle to uh, get people to call himself Lamont, but uh, it didn't happen. And I've grown up being called Lamont, and I'm not changing now. <laughs> no, no, you don't want to change it once it's stuck, do you? So was your yeah. father, was he... The surgeon in Shetland, is that right? That was according to my Wikipedia research, so it may not be that accurate. No, well, that, 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 that is right. My father, um, I think he founded the old Gilbert Bain Hospital, which is op, op, used to be opposite the, I don't know what it is now, the Lerwick Infant School. Hmm, I'm not sure if it's moved, but I think it might still be in the same place. I'm not sure there's still an infant school there. My little brother, my younger brother, actually works in that hospital, so that's pretty fantastic to hear but your it, dad it's found a, it. No, the, 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 there's the modern Gilbert Bain, which is up on top of the hill. Yes. The old Gilbert Bain was a sort of uh, building with little towers, which was um, at the the... I don't know what the road is, the bottom of the... If You you, you, you know where the, the present Gilbert Bain is? Absolutely. If you were coming into Lerwick from it, you go down the hill, mm-hmm. uh, you pass Borough Road, where I used to live, on the left, right? Yeah, yeah. And, and then you go up to the bottom of the next hill. I can't remember what that's called. Um, and the infant school is on your left. Um, I think that's King Herald Street, is it? That rings a bell, um, I think so. Yeah, and on your right was the, the hospital. Fantastic, so your father founded that, though? That... Well, I think he set it up initially, and I may be wrong on that, but he, what he certainly did was to um, run a field hospital uh, at Tingwall mm-hmm. during the Second World War. Fantastic. So when did you leave then? Did you say when you were 13 that you left Shetland? Well, I was just wondering whether that was correct. I left Shetland when I was uh, about 10, 10 I think. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, but we then moved to Scotland and we lived at Bridge of Earn. And then we moved uh, after about three years to England okay. when I was 13. So what are your memories of Shetland? I mean, you were able to describe Borough Road, King Harold Street there. So is that from is that from more recent trips, or do you remember it as a child? No, no, I, no, I remember it vividly. Uh, of course I do. Um, 
No, because I, I, I went to the infant school and then the Lerwick Central School, which is just back behind, I don't know what it is still, um, back behind the infant school. They're back to back. Are they still that? I can't remember. In King Harold Street. We'll get, we'll get listeners to phone in and tell us. Now, still... your name, I mean, you don't sound very Shetland, but I thought the name Thor might have a Scandinavian connection. Oh, Lord Lamont, oh dear. This is, we talked about your name at the beginning. My name has caused no end of um, mystery and conversation over the years. So my parents were hippies, Soothmuthers, who moved to Shetland in the early 70s, and I was born, ah. and, bro- born and brought up there, and I possibly had more of a Shetland yeah. accent as a youth. A little bit, at least, and now I've right. lived in mainland Scotland for more than twenty years. All ah, right, right. No, I, I would recognise a Shetland accent anywhere. So, sp- speaking of, uh, well, we're, we're speaking about kind of cross-border there, England, Scotland, and accents. It would seem from my. But you curse- came back, and then you came. What made you come back uh, to Shetland? Well, I go up and down to Shetland all the time because I still have uh, relatives there. My parents still live there, and my right, young, so you don't younger live brothers there. there. You- Nope. Oh, no. right. But you, you, oh, I see. Right. We're all sort of more and more bogus. <laughs> no. <laughs> well, thank you very much. No, no, I <laughs> I've, I write opinion pieces for the Shetland Times. And I see. Now, when I saw the name Thor Holt, I thought, ah, genuine Shetland. And then when I heard your accent, I thought, hmm. <laughs> well, there you go. What, what makes someone a genuine citizen of a place? Because I was born and brought up in Shetland on a little island called Papastua, which you... Yes, have, I know where Papastur is. It, so how do you get more Shetland than that, unless we're saying that nationality has to be down to bloodlines, and then I guess we're into complex territory. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of which, from my scan of the papers yesterday, Nicola Sturgeon seems to be gearing up for a second independence referendum. Have we, have we got any wisdom for her? She's sure to be an avid listener of the Shetland Times podcast. Um, well... Uh, I, I hope we won't have a second referendum. I think referenda ought to be, uh, you know, occasional. You can't just keep testing public opinion until you get the answer you want. I think that's quite a wrong way of proceeding. I mean, I think referenda ought to be rare events to, you know, measure the deep toe of public opinion. And you don't think it's significant? But I, I, I thought I thought we were going to be talking about Shetland. I didn't realise we were going to be talking <laughs> about other. <laughs> it's of interest to Shetlanders, and you're a man who knows what's going on in the world politically and has a bit of wisdom from years out there in the world. Yeah, yeah. Okay, but uh, I hope we were going to talk largely about Shetland because that's what I was looking forward to. <laughs> well, I'd love I'd love you to talk about Shetland. No, well, I, you know, I do sort of think of Shetland still as home. I, you know, very rarely get up there, but uh, I have a cousin, Diane Watt, who uh, lives uh, near Clickamin mm-hmm. on, uh, is it called Westerloch? Is that the, the road that goes around the, uh, the Clickamin Loch? Around the back um, of the loch, yes, you're right. Yeah. So, uh, m- m- most of my family on my mother's side I mean, my father um, came from Argyllshire and came to Shetland during the war, Mm -hmm. as I said, and worked in this field hospital at Tingwell. And uh, he so enjoyed Shetland, so liked it, that he decided to stay. And he stayed, um, well, right up until his health gave out. My my father used to do... um, well, he used to, you know, because he was the only surgeon on the island, mm-hmm. he he had to do an awful lot of different things. And my father was involved in quite a sort of dramatic incident when he was trying to deliver uh, some sort of complicated baby delivery on Fair Isle, okay. which he was directing from a lifeboat <laughs> uh, off the coast of Fair Isle. And it was in a very, very stormy sea. And my father was flung from one side of the lifeboat to the other and broke his leg and several ribs. Um, And really, his sort of health deteriorated a bit after that. But, um, you know, I I remember that incident very well. It was sort of national newspaper stuff. And I remember sitting in the dining room table. We lived in Borough Road in a house called Ordgarth. 
mm-hmm. and I remember hearing the balloon. You, you didn't call it the balloon. The noise when when the lifeboat crew were summoned. Do you remember? There's a sort of noise they make, which can be heard all over the town. Yeah. And my father got up and said, uh, "I've got to go." And it was only sort of late at night. He came back on crutches. That is incredible. So, what was the result in terms of the? So it wasn't the baby. The baby result, yeah. The baby was um, was, was saved. I mean, uh, I don't suppose there are many people in Shetland remember my father now, uh, because uh, you know he died in the 1970s. Mm-hmm. But whenever I've gone back periodically, you know, until recent years, well, even recently. Um, I've always had people come up and tell me the most amazing stories about, you know, what my father had done for them or how he'd performed an operation. And, uh, you know, I've had some quite funny remarks made. But what really struck me was how people appreciated medical care in Shetland. And, you know, they would... I I think in London, people just regard the NHS as an institution. They would never Mm -hmm. sort of write a letter of thank you to a surgeon or a doctor, really. But, you know, I was just overwhelmed by, you know, I'd be walking in the street and people would come up and talk about my father. I I met a a friend of mine I was introduced to because I was walking in the street in London, in Piccadilly, and this person came up to me and said, "Uh, your father brought me into the world. (laughs) (laughs) This was in Piccadilly? (laughs) Yes. Superb. This was and a, a was fellow Shetlander. In, yeah, it was someone who'd been born in Shetland. He, he now lives in France. Um, and only this week, I received an email out of the blue from somebody I don't know who said, I owe my life to a father. And uh, the, the story was that uh, his mother had been ill and doctors had decided that... Uh, the baby, which was him, should be sacrificed to save the mother's life. Uh, and my father disagreed, and my father insisted that they try to save both the baby's life and the mother's life, mm-hmm. and that actually happened. And so this person said, I owe my existence to your father. Wow, it's a superb story. Quite a man, your, your father, by the sounds of it, Lord Lamont. So what happened then? So he was unwell after this incident on the lifeboat where he broke his leg and ribs is that did that cause yeah. other complications or well i don't know i think uh well you know he had to do quite a lot of that sort of stuff going on lifeboats and going around the islands and i think it just became a bit bit much for him mm-hmm. and so he, he he left he wrote a little book which was published by the shepherd times called seagirt citadel Say that again, Seagirt. Yes, C-S-E-A-G-I-R-T. I I think that's two words. I think that means, I I think it was citadel. Well, you understand what a citadel is. I think it's a quotation from somebody. I think it means a citadel surrounded by sea. I'll look that that book up, see if it's still in print. Yes. Fantastic. We'll put that in the show notes. And then my my mother, sorry, I'm rabbiting on. Rabbiting on is good. That'll stop me asking uh, any difficult political questions. You rabbit away, sir. My my mother taught French at the uh, Anderson Institute. My old school. Yeah, um, she was. She was. My my mother was born in Mossbank, mm-hmm. um, at uh, Toft, and uh, she she was she she went to Edinburgh University and studied modern languages, and. Uh, then came back to Shetland and taught at the uh, Arthur Anderson Institute. Um, my mother was, I think, quite remarkable. She was born in 1910, but I know she visited Germany and France in the late 1930s, which I mm-hmm. thought was quite good for a, a woman in those days, you know, unusual to go to university. And then she traveled and looked around Nazi Germany in the 1930s and then came back to Shetland. So was she... That is a, that is incredible. Yeah, was she a kind of a pure bred Shetlander, as it were, with many generations back, or what was the story? Yeah, of her my, family? my absolutely. My mother's name was Hewson, H U G H S O N, and in my family tree there are lots of Hewsons. 
<laughs> I, I, um, I'm not sure. I think my grandmother's maiden name was Houston as well, mm-hmm. um, as well as my grandfather's maiden name being called Houston. Um, and as I say, they lived very near to Sulumvo. I, I mean, I was very, I'm very interested in bird watching, and that was something I learned from Shetland. Um, and I used to go uh, up to Moss Bank and then drive down to the ferry going to Yell, mm-hmm. where I used to enjoy watching the skewers and the terns and all that sort of, and the eider duck. Yeah, birds like that, big, big part of my own youth, getting dive bombed by bonksies and tiddocks yeah. and things out, out on the wilder parts of the islands. I've just found the yeah. book, by the way, your father's book. So it's Daniel Lamont. Was that your father? Yes. Yeah. Fantastic. Yes. It's on Amazon. It's still there. Seagirt Citadel, hardcover, 1973. Yeah. Let's see how much it would set us back. £8.20, we could have a copy. Gosh, that's held its value well. <laughs> oh, hold on. Two collectible. No, no, more than that. £29.98. There are two collectible. Seven used from £8.20 and two collectible from £29.98. Have you got a copy? <laughs> yeah, I've got several copies. <laughs> you can get them on Amazon and sell them for £30 each. Well, that's fantastic. Okay, we'll put that in the show notes because I think people will be interested in that. And it's interesting that your, so your mother was a Houston because, yeah, that's a fairly um, Shetlandic common name. name. It's a common name in Shetland. Yeah. yeah. Yes, and uh, I also had an uncle, Bobby, who I think he was more at Firth. I, my memory is getting a bit confused between Toft and Firth, but actually I do know where Firth is. Um, and he was in the the Merchant Navy. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I had an aunt at Nesting as well. Yeah. An aunt Harriet at Nesting. Um, anyway, I remember years later when I was a minister in the Department of Energy, I came back to the opening of the Sulumvo Terminal with the Duke of Edinburgh, and I thought, wow, well, I can look at the Bonksies again. <laughs> <laughs> and did you go and look at the Bonksies? Of course. I could see everyone else was looking at the oil installations. I was looking at the Ida duck and the bonksies. That's fantastic. That's a that's a good. Uh, that might make a good title for the for the podcast episode. Something about <laughs> bonksies. <laughs> Wonderful. So you did you did work closely with Lady Thatcher, I guess, uh, in, uh, in multiple governments. In now we're leaving well, Shetland. We are leaving Shetland, <laughs> but you see, that's that's the thing that's going to be in a lot of people's heads if they hear your name would be that particular political period, which is kind of burnt into my memory, even though I'm, what am I, 43? And I guess that would have been my childhood. So I don't know, it was quite a powerful and in some ways polarizing time. So it's just a strong memory. And I guess a lot of people will will remember that. Is that is that something that you think on? Or is it does it just drift off into the mists of time? No, I mean, in my political life, uh... My working with Mrs. Thatcher, I was there the whole of her government. I was with her before she became prime minister. You know, she sort of defines my political life, really. Mm-hmm. Um, and I very, you know, privileged to have been part of uh, uh, her administration. And she was a remarkable human being. Uh, you know, I really admired her and liked her. Interesting that you would say remarkable, because I would agree, but... Uh... As I said, she she's obviously polarizing in the way that certain modern leaders, who I won't even mention, might be termed polarizing as well. Do you think that's a good thing? Because, I don't know, it's... Well, I'll leave it at that. It's kind of an open question. No, well, I mean, of course there were divided views on Mrs. Thatcher, uh, and probably are more so in Scotland today than in England. Mm-hmm. Um that 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 is true, but I would say I think generally um, the verdict of history on uh, Mrs. Thatcher, you know, so far is a, a you know a largely positive one. Mm-hmm. Um, and he, I would say yes, she had to make some very painful decisions, painful in the sense that they sometimes affected people adversely, but they were for the greater national good. Uh, and I think uh, that is how it worked out and how many people perceive it, that you know, she had to divide in order to unite, in order to solve certain problems. 
Um, but, you know, obviously that has left a, a legacy of controversy. But uh, as I say, I think she had great achievements in her time. Uh, uh, she always did what she thought was the right thing. She had a very strong moral compass, you know, wasn't influenced by anything other than trying to do the best for the country. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm scared to ask you this next question that I hope to ask you. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Well, I'm... Yeah. Well, it's it's um it's actually one that my editor was interested in as well, and that was, do you have you got any thoughts on now? There was a bit of debate about this in the papers recently about never mind Scotland trying to become independent again, but about the islands, as in Orkney, Shetland, going after some form of Faroese model where they're autonomous. What do you think of that? Well, I think if that is what. Uh, a majority of Shetland Island. I mean, in the event of Scotland becoming independent, yes. If if uh, a majority of Shetland Islanders thought that was a, uh, a sensible thing and a good thing, uh, I think it should be pursued. In if 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 Scotland were independent, um, I think it would be looking for Faroese type. Uh, devolution would be a perfectly legitimate thing to ask for. I mean, I hesitate to say that because, you know, I don't want to, you know, sometimes I think Shetlanders think that unionists, you know, and I am a unionist, I believe, in the United Kingdom, who express sympathy for that idea, are just trying to stir it up. And I'm not just trying to stir it up. I'm honestly answering the question as I see it. I mean, I remember when the so-called independence movement was a lot stronger and had uh, quite a lot of councillors on the Shetland Islands Council. Mm -hmm. um, it's always seemed to me an idea that was likely to rear its head again in the event of Scottish independence. And I was rather surprised it didn't earlier on at the time of the Scottish referendum, because although you know, you'd occasionally see a, a normally a, a national newspaper reference to it. I didn't really get the impression that uh, it was stirring very strongly in Shetland at the time of the referendum. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, speaking of politics, you've obviously had a, a phenomenally successful career in politics. What advice would you give to, say, a young Shetlander at school or at university who was, you know, considering trying to get into politics, either on a Scottish or a national level? Well, I don't know about advice. Um, there are many routes into uh, politics. But rather than advice, I would just want to encourage people who are minded to go into politics not to be uh, afraid, because it's, it's quite sort of rough with the, the modern media, but really to pursue it, because I think it is a very rewarding thing, you know, in your own small way, you can make a, a difference. The world may not know you've made a difference, but you can have a satisfaction of having contributed in your own small way to changing things for the better. That's what it's all, all about. Um, and, you know, I think I do very, very strongly believe everybody should be interested in politics. There's no use complaining about politicians and then refusing to participate or have anything to, to do with it. I think every, every, everyone should be interested in politics, and I would encourage people, young people, to pursue a career in, in, in politics, uh, a, a life of, of service. That is what it's meant, meant to be. Um, when I was at school, I mean, my other school after I left Shetland, I had a schoolmaster who um, said that in Greek, the, the word for idiot was apoliti. I'm not quite sure how that's spelt in Greek lettering, which means apolitical, a person who's not interested in politics. Mm -hmm. And I, I believe that is correct. I did once look it up in the, uh, in the dictionary. Uh, the, the Greeks thought that a person who was not interested in politics was an idiot. And, uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not saying there aren't many human activities that aren't just as valuable as politics, but I think everyone should be interested in politics. It's funny, though, isn't it? I, I totally agree with you, actually. But I I would say it's one of those things that Mrs. Holt tells me to play nice if we go out for dinner. And what that means is don't talk about <laughs> politics. <laughs> well, I've never followed that advice, as you can imagine. <laughs> <laughs> well, 
No, absolutely. I did end up at a meal and a, a young Russian couple were there and I started chatting politics with this Russian gentleman until at one point he just folded his arms and said, I will not speak to you any further. <laughs> So yes, perhaps uh, she had a point when it comes to me. Maybe you're more diplomatic than me, Lord Lamont. <laughs> I don't think so. Um, no, not at all. So, um, I came to Apelliar a few years ago. Mm-hmm. How did and, you find that? Uh, I, I loved it. Um, I thought. I mean, I've been several times, but um, uh, I really enjoyed. I, I think I came about five years ago. I nearly tried to come again this last year, but maybe I'll come try next year. Um, But I took uh, my children with me, um, who are now grown up, of course. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, I had taken them to Shetland before, but not to... uh, uh, I took them once before, and sort of we drove around. Um, But they absolutely adored uh, Abhelia. I also took my daughter-in-law with me, um, it was a, a really great e- experience. What, what else other than Apelia? That's kind of the classic one, isn't it, if people are visiting Shetland. What else would you suggest? You've mentioned bird watching. What else in Shetland would you recommend visitors go to see? Um, well, I like looking at some of the... I'd like to... I've never been to Musa, to the Brock there. I'd like to go there and have a look at that. Also, there are the stormy petrels on Musa, which I've never seen. <laughs> This is this is that you, you'll have heard the term the the bucket list the things we should do before we depart this mortal coil and uh, maybe you need to make sure you fit that in next. Well, time I don't actually no. I tell you where I've never been, where I want to go is the Skerries. I've never been, and you know I just have this sort of vision in my mind of these little islands, you know, right out there on the uh, east side. Um, I'd really like to go there and have a look. Perhaps you need to sail up. You need to get a skipper on a small boat and go and visit all the islands. Um, well, I've visited most, um, but I have never been to the Skerries, and I sort of feel a gap gap there. Um, I did a few years ago also go and look at Fetla, which I think is unbelievably beautiful. Mm-hmm. I, of course, I couldn't help trying to see if there was a snowy isle there, but there wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> so you, are you a visitor to Fair Isle then? Because that's the, the place with the kind of the name for the bird observatory and things. Yes, I was, my father was very friendly with someone called Kenneth Williamson, mm-hmm. who was the director of the bird observatory there. And we went there regularly. Um, you know, I was, we, we went by boat. I always remember being sort of terrified getting off the boat into a little dinghy, you know, to be rowed ashore. Because <laughs> what, what has changed in Shetland since I was there? You know, all these runways on different islands. I'm not sure. That, is there a runway on Fair Isle? I'm not sure. Yeah. Oh, but, absolutely. Yes. Yeah, but there are runways all over these different islands. I mean, two things have changed very much. Well, lots of lots of things have changed. But transport has got very much better between the islands. Um, a, the roads are better. I mean, when I went from Lerwick, to Mossbank, driven by my father or mother. I mean, it was quite a long journey by by road. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it was a sort of one car road with passing points, um, and in the winter it could be rather rather treacherous. Whereas now you have a much better road. I think you can get there in one forty five minutes or something like that. Um, but also, you you now have these small. Uh, they must be very expensive roll-off, roll-on small ferries, which I've never seen anywhere else in the world. I mean, when you go to uh, Yell, you have this small ferry, and what does it take, eight cars or something like that? I mean, it's tiny. Well, um, and you can commute. You can commute from Yell to Lerac, yes. because I, I'm yes. speaking to a chap the other day who commutes. So it's incredible. Yes. <laughs> yes. But, you know, when I lived in Shetland... Um, not only was it very difficult to get from island to island. I mean, my mother lived in Mossbank. She'd never been to Fetler in her life. I mean, I think it was the most amazing criticism of her. Um, She'd been to Nazi Germany and France, but hadn't got around to Fetler. <laughs> that's <laughs> yes, incredible. That's right. <laughs> um, yeah. 
Uh, sorry, what was I about to say? I can't remember what I was about I'm to say. I'm sure, sorry, um, I rudely interrupted you when I realised the how incredible that was, that back in those days, your mother had made the effort to go travelling around Europe, but hadn't managed to get to Fetler. That's superb. She must have been quite yeah, a character. She had, she, had, <laughs> she had been to Amst, but... Uh, <laughs> you know. yeah. Had she been to Papa no. Stewart, I wonder? The centre of the known I think, universe. I think she'd been to Papa Stewart. I've been to Papa Stewart. Oh, have you? Um, yeah. What were you Some up to years there? ago. Sorry? What, were your, what was your reason for visiting Papa Stewart? I just went to have a look, I think, on one of the visits I made to Shetland. I have been there. Um, so, um, yeah, I was also, you know, very interested in Shetland poetry. Who's your, who's your favourite? Uh, Haldane Burgess, Skrana Hill, the deal he came down the hill back of Skrana, but Grinda San Smaapn and Hisana. And so we are glubs, and the dios ain't glower. He spat in his lifts and clumped until the hour. Have you... That is in your memory, sir? Yes. I love it. It's so rare these days that people bother to to, to even read poetry, in my experience, but when people have actually yeah. memorised also, I don't know, I just think it's wonderful. I... Whenever... I mean, I occasionally get asked to speak at Burns Night, mm -hmm. and when I do, I always quote a little bit of Shetland poetry just to remind them there's another type of Scottish poetry apart from Lowland Scots. Nice one. You're still fighting the fighting the corner for the Shetlanders. I like it. Yeah. Um, no, when I was... I remember when I was at Cambridge, I, I sort of wrote a bit of a project on Shetland poetry, actually, covering, you know, people like uh, Haldane Burgess, particularly. Um, James Stout, I think his name was. Was it Angus Stout, James Stout? I can't remember. Um, Where would Vagalan. we find this? Sorry, I was going to say, could, could we find this somewhere? Was it published? No, 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 it wasn't published. No, oh. no, not at all. But uh, no, I have a, I have a, a shelf with my books of Shetland poetry. Maybe we'll get a picture of that to illustrate the episode. The, the editor was asking me to ask people for headshots, but maybe uh, your your Shetland poetry collection would make a good visual. Uh, well, it's about ten books, but there we are. Um, but I didn't have a picture of it. Um, I used to have a I used to have a photograph. I I think I've lost it, but I used to have a photograph. Uh, we used to have our own up Heliar in uh, the back garden of my neighbour in Borough Road. who they, they were very nice people called Shearer, and my closest friend was someone called Lawrence Shearer, who I think mm -hmm. is still alive. Um, but we... Lawrence's father built a, a little Viking galley, and we had our own helmets with horns coming out of them. Terrific. <laughs> and Dressed up as right, but I'm afraid I've lost the I've lost the photograph. I think, or I don't know where it is. Anyway, that would have been a really good visual for mm. the article for the episode. So, I was going to usually I would ask people how listeners can connect with you, but maybe you don't want anyone connecting with you. There's they can probably find you in the um, the House of Lords, can't they? Uh, yes, website. I had. Yes, I had some visitors from. Uh, Shetland relatives of my cousin who came to see me the other day, so I had a good, good long talk about Shetland with them. Well, before you but no, go, people, go on, sorry, people can contact me through the House of Lords. You, know, can, you can always leave messages there. Yeah, wonderful. Okay, well, thank you very much for coming on the on the show on the Shetland Times podcast. Hugely appreciate your time and your old stories, and uh, well done for getting out of my political questioning. <laughs> <laughs> I, well, I wasn't trying to uh, avoid that. I mean, I'm very happy always to answer political questions. But, you know, when you got in touch with me and I replied saying I'm very happy to do that, I thought it was because I was getting able to talk about Shetland. No, absolutely. No, and it's wonderful. So I, you know, politics, there's enough of, there's enough talk about that without us having to fill this podcast with it as well. So it was really nice to hear your, your stories and memories and to hear more about your father, Daniel Lamont. He sounds like quite a guy. Great. Great. Okay. Thank Anytime. you very much. Thank you. Bye. Hope you enjoyed that conversation with Lord Norman Lamont of Lerick, of course. Please do go to the shetlandtimes.co.uk or to the Shetland Times Facebook page. Suggest folk that you'd like us to interview.
And also you can feed back to me on today's interview or on any topic at Thor Holt on Twitter or over at my site, thorholt.com. That's T-H-O-R-H-O-L-T.com. See you next time.